Hi, guys, and welcome to Suffer the Little Children, the true crime podcast giving voices back to the victims of child abuse and shining a harsh spotlight on the parents, guardians, and caretakers who silence them. I'm your host, Lane, and this is Episode 5, Thomas Valva, Part 1. I first blogged about Thomas's story on January 29, 2020 on SufferTheLittleChildrenBlog.com, and I've written several update posts about his case since. For those not familiar with this story, Thomas Valva was an eight-year-old boy on the autism spectrum who lived on Long Island with his father, Michael Valva, who was a New York Police Department transit officer, and his father's fiancée, Angela Polina. Thomas died in January of this year after Michael and Angela allegedly forced him to spend the night in the unheated garage of the family's home on a night when temperatures dropped well below freezing. Since there's so much information out there about this case, including video and audio that I'd like to play for you on the podcast, I'm going to tell Thomas's story over the course of two episodes. My sources for today's episode were Newsday, The Washington Post, Live Science, Wikipedia, The Long Island Press, The New York Times, The Daily Beast, PIX11, Facebook, Twitter, NBC New York, CBS New York, and Patch.com. Before I get started, I just want to say that I hope you're all staying safe, healthy, and socially distant during this worldwide coronavirus pandemic we're currently experiencing. My kids and I have been self-quarantined for a week, and I count it as a win that my 12-year-old and my 15-year-old haven't driven each other or me completely up a wall by now. My sincerest admiration goes out to parents with younger kids trying to deal with homeschooling and keeping their little ones occupied without really leaving the house. It's hard for the older kids to wrap their heads around social distancing and the concept of being quarantined, but it must be nearly impossible for the younger ones. Just hang in there, everybody. We're going to get through this. On the morning of January 17, 2020, a 911 call from a couple on speakerphone summoned Suffolk County Police to 11 Bittersweet Lane in Center Moriches, New York, which is located on Long Island. This was the home where 40-year-old Michael Valva and his fiancée, 42-year-old Angela Polina, lived with their blended family of six children. When police arrived at approximately 9.40 a.m., they encountered Michael, a New York City police officer, performing CPR on his unresponsive 8-year-old autistic son, Thomas Justin Valva. According to Michael, while waiting for his school bus that morning, Thomas fell in the driveway and lost consciousness. Thomas was rushed to Long Island Community Hospital, where he was pronounced dead. His core temperature at that time was 76 degrees Fahrenheit, or 24.4 degrees Celsius. The average temperature of a live human being is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, or 37 degrees Celsius. Michael's story of a fall in the driveway quickly fell apart, and investigators determined that as punishment for some real or imagined transgression, Michael and Angela had forced Thomas and his 10-year-old brother, Anthony, who was also on the autism spectrum, to spend the night in the unheated garage attached to the family home. Temperatures in Center Mariches had reached an overnight low of 19 degrees Fahrenheit. During an autopsy, the medical examiner ruled Thomas's death a homicide, with a major contributing factor of hypothermia. Before I continue, I just want you to understand exactly what happens to the human body during hypothermia, which occurs when the body temperature falls to about 95 degrees Fahrenheit or lower. Symptoms of mild hypothermia include shivering, weakness, and confusion. The body tries to divert blood flow to the core, which means a loss of feeling in the fingers, toes, nose, and ears. Confusion occurs when blood flow to the brain is reduced. Moderate hypothermia brings drowsiness, uncontrollable shivering, failing motor skills, and deeper confusion. When the condition becomes severe, the person experiences extreme fatigue. Shivering stops and blood flow returns to the extremities as the body all but gives up on keeping the core warm, which can make the hypothermic individual feel as if his skin is on fire. Severe hypothermia leads to inadequate heart function, which in turn leads to reduced blood flow to other organs. This can put the body into a state of shock and can result in multiple organ failure. When the body temperature reaches about 82 degrees Fahrenheit, loss of consciousness can occur, and below 70 degrees, which is considered profound hypothermia, death can occur, usually due to cardiac arrest. 
Now, just imagine how little Anthony and Thomas felt, banished to the garage with its bare concrete floor for the entire night, as the temperature outside the unheated structure fell to 19 degrees. How much pain and fear did Thomas feel before his confusion became so great that he lost awareness of the gravity of his situation? After digging into this case, I can honestly say that what Michael and Angela are accused of doing to these children is truly one of the worst cases of child abuse I've ever encountered. Michael and Angela told an EMT who responded to their 911 call, who noted that Thomas was cold to the touch, that the boy had hit his head on a door jam. However, a report to Suffolk County caseworkers from Aaron Lambert, an EMT who responded to the scene, quote, Thomas Valva was observed with visible abrasion to his face like road rash, which could have resulted by being dragged across pavement, end quote. Aaron described her experience at the scene, quote, The child was ice cold to the touch. Thomas wasn't wearing underwear or a shirt, and his sweatpants were pulled down to his knees. Michael told Aaron that Thomas hit his head on the doorframe and then wet his pants. He told her he gave Thomas a shower and then put him on the couch in the basement. According to the report, Aaron confronted Michael on the spot, telling him that his version of events was inconsistent with the severity of Thomas's injuries. At that point, Michael changed his story, saying that Thomas was heading up the driveway to catch the school bus when he fell face-first onto the pavement. Nothing says I'm telling the truth like a story that changes when someone confronts you. Aaron's report also stated that Thomas had involuntarily defecated and, quote, had additional abrasions to his knees, elbows, and right flank, end quote. When Angela was questioned by detectives, she gave them the username and password for their extensive video and audio surveillance system, through which the couple monitored all six children in their care, which included Michael's three sons, 10-year-old Anthony, 8-year-old Thomas, and 6-year-old Andrew, as well as Angela's three daughters, 11-year-old twins Milana and Delana, and 6-year-old Gia. As police began going through the videos, someone remotely changed the password and deleted some of the videos. What they were able to attain led police to the conclusion that at least some of the children, mainly Thomas and Anthony, were disciplined using some extremely cruel and unusual forms of punishment. On Friday, January 24th, Michael and Angela were each hit with a charge of second-degree murder, which Suffolk County Police Commissioner Geraldine Hart addressed during a press conference on January 24th. Before we begin, I want to express my sincerest condolences to Thomas Valva's family and friends, especially his siblings. We are here to discuss the arrests of Michael Valva and Angela Polina for the death of Michael's eight-year-old son, Thomas. The couple has been charged with murder in the second degree because they engaged in conduct which created a grave risk of death to this child. Thomas Valva was subjected to freezing temperatures in the home's unheated garage overnight when the outside temperature was 19 degrees. We first responded to 11 Bittersweet Lane in Cinema Riches on January the 17th at 9.40 a.m. after Michael Valva reported that his son Thomas fell in the driveway while waiting for the school bus an hour earlier. Michael indicated that his son lost consciousness after the fall and had remained unconscious. When the officers arrived, Michael Valva was performing CPR on his son in the basement. Thomas was transported to Long Island Community Hospital, where he was pronounced dead. At the time of his arrival at the hospital, Thomas's body temperature was 76 degrees. As with any unattended death, homicide detectives conducted an investigation which revealed inconsistencies in the timing and the nature of the child's injuries as reported by his father. We have determined Thomas was never in the driveway that morning and he suffered head and facial injuries that were not consistent with the father's account. During the past week, homicide detectives conducted a round-the-clock investigation which included the review of video and audio recordings captured on the family's home surveillance system, both inside and outside the house. 
The recordings show the pair was closely monitoring the activities and conversations of their six children, Michael's three sons, ages six, eight, and 10, and Angela's daughters, 11-year-old twins and a six-year-old. We believe that the 10 and eight-year-old boys were subjected to punishment, included, including food deprivation and exposure to extremely frigid temperatures. We are still investigating the extent of the abuse and if it extended to all the children. Following Thomas's death, the department notified Suffolk County CPS and assisted in the emergency removal of the other five children on January the 17th. The children are currently in a safe environment. These arrests are not the end of the investigation. We are still processing evidence and conducting interviews. This case has hit our department hard, even the most seasoned detectives. I would like to thank our homicide squad for their countless hours in seeking justice for this little boy. I would also like to acknowledge and thank all the agencies that assisted us in this investigation, the New York City Police Department, the East Mauritia School District, the FBI, the Department of Social Services, the Medical Examiner, and the District Attorney's Office. Prosecutors said that police were able to view surveillance video from prior to Thomas's death, depicting him and Anthony huddled, shivering on the garage floor, with no blankets, pillows, or even a mattress shielding them from the cold concrete. One of the video cameras trained on the garage was labeled Kids' Room, suggesting the garage was considered the boys' bedroom. The five surviving children were removed from the home the same day Thomas was pronounced dead, and each placed into the custody of their other biological parent. Suffolk County District Attorney Timothy D. Seney described Thomas's death as, quote, one of the worst crimes I've ever seen, end quote. Continuing, quote, the depravity of these defendants is shocking. They caused the death of this little boy, and then they watched him die, end quote. Michael, who has been with the New York Police Department for over 15 years and was most recently assigned to the NYPD's Transit Bureau, has been suspended without pay pending the outcome of the case, according to NYPD Commissioner Dermot Shea, who remarked that the allegations against Michael are disturbing. That's a bit of an understatement, don't you think? Michael and Angela were indicted on January 29th. During the indictment hearing, the district attorney's office detailed horrific abuse that left the boy's mother, Justina Zubkovalva, who clutched Thomas's prayer card, in tears. Allegedly, Michael and Angela inflicted upon Thomas and Anthony a great deal of both physical and verbal abuse, including depriving the boys of food, blankets, pillows, and clean clothing. Prosecutors said both boys sometimes showed up at school either soaked in urine or wearing diapers because they were not permitted to use the bathroom at home. They also said that Angela texted video clips from the couple's extensive home security network to Michael while he was at work, and that the couple exchanged text messages in which Michael called Thomas a fucking moron and a stupid fucking son of a bitch when the little boy, his own son, repeatedly fell to the concrete garage floor while experiencing hypothermia. Evil exists, ladies and gentlemen, and I believe Michael Valva and Angela Polina are two of its poster children. District Attorney Carrie Ann Kelly described the ghastly allegations against Michael and Angela at the indictment hearing, quote, nothing short of cruel, callous, wanton evil. The boys were literally begging for food at school, eating crumbs off the table, eating out of garbage cans, going under bleachers, slapped and punched and carried by the wrists with their feet not touching the floor. Thomas was thrown and dragged down a flight of stairs, end quote. The prosecution alleged that while Thomas's ice-cold, lifeless body lay on the floor in the bathroom, Angela stood nearby fixing her hair in the mirror. Even more chilling was their claim that after Michael was informed in the hospital of Thomas's death, his response was, quote, I've been through more stressful things than this, end quote. The depth of this couple's psychopathy is unimaginable. I've always wondered how creeps like this manage to find each other, is there a dating site catering to these people, like OnlySociopaths.com or something? At their arraignment hearing, both defendants pled not guilty to the charges against them. Considering the evidence against them includes both audio and video recordings of the two of them allegedly abusing the boys, 
It should be interesting to see how that works out for them. Prosecutors brought up audio recorded the morning of January 17th, prior to the arrival of police on scene. During this recording, a child asks why Thomas can't walk. Angela responds, quote, because he's hypothermic. When you're washed with cold water and it's freezing, you get hypothermia, end quote. That statement begs the question, did these monsters douse that baby with cold water before banishing him to the garage? Michael adds, quote, he keeps face planting on the concrete, end quote. Angela replies, quote, you know why he's falling, end quote. Michael's response is devoid of all empathy for his own son. Quote, because he's cold, boo fucking who, end quote. Angela asks, quote, what are you doing, end quote. Michael says, quote, I'm fucking suffocating him, that's what I'm doing, end quote. Angela snaps at him, quote, get your hand off his mouth, there's people everywhere, end quote. Chilling. The prosecution said that the recordings also indicate Michael put Thomas, who was already unconscious, into a hot bath to try to raise his body temperature. Obviously, this was too little too late. Suffolk County Assistant District Attorney Laura Newcomb said, quote, They knew he was suffering from hypothermia and they failed to get him any help, end quote. Sini said, quote, They failed to do anything to help him as he died right in front of their eyes. Not only did they fail to render any type of meaningful aid, they lied to the police officers, they lied to the EMTs, end quote. Court documents refer to an incident that took place two years ago. The document reads, On January 13, 2018, Respondent, Michael, became enraged with Thomas Valva and made the then six-year-old child lean over a table with his hands stretched out and Respondent repeatedly hit Thomas on the buttocks. This caused the child significant pain and numerous bruises. The document goes on to say that the incident reportedly caused Thomas injury to his lower back that was still causing him pain three days later. That's not what I would call a spanking. Michael and Angela are both being held without bail. Thank God. Matt Tuohy, Angela's defense attorney, told the Washington Post, quote, Right now she is maintaining her innocence. It's going to be a long road. There's a lot of evidence that hasn't been brought out, end quote. So, in other words, he's singing the same old tune favored by defense lawyers since the beginning of time. I'll reserve my amazement for the moment he reveals this fabled evidence. Prior to his arrest, Michael had the colossal balls to create a GoFundMe page where he posted, quote, It is with great sadness that I must bury my eight-year-old son. He passed recently due to a tragic accident. At this time, I am not able to handle these unforeseen costs on my own, and if there is any help anyone can provide, we would greatly appreciate it. In lieu of floral arrangements, we ask that a donation be made instead. Thank you for your help and sympathy. End quote. This piece of shit raked in over $10,000 from more than 200 donors before the results of Thomas's autopsy were revealed. After that report was released, however, the proverbial shit hit the fan. GoFundMe removed the page on January 24th after a massive social media outcry demanding it be taken down. Megan Scripture of GoFundMe Communications made a statement saying, quote, We removed the campaign and all donors will be refunded in full. The campaign organizer has also been banned from using the GoFundMe platform for any future campaigns, end quote. I don't think that will bother Michael much, though, since it's hard to open a GoFundMe campaign from behind bars. Thirty-six-year-old Justina Zubko Valva, who is the estranged wife of Michael Valva and the mother of the three boys, has been telling anyone who would listen for years that Michael was abusive to the children. She and Michael were married in 2004. Justina described Michael as unpredictable, with difficulty controlling his anger. Michael filed for divorce in 2015. He was a cop who could afford an attorney. Justina was a Polish immigrant who could not. Michael hated Justina more than he loved his children, and it seemed he would do anything to hurt her. The deck was stacked against Justina, especially when Michael filed false accusations of child abuse against her during the acrimonious divorce proceedings. In near the end of 2017, she lost custody of the boys she loved so much. Prior to Thomas's death, Justina had not seen her children for two years. 
Justina created a Twitter account named Stand Against Child Abuse, which documents the tragic story of a mother trying her damnedest to save her babies from the monster who helped create them. In videos Justina posted on January 7, 2018, Andrew talks about punishment at his father's house. I was the best Daddy, at his house. You weren't. You just had a pee-pee accident. Yes. That's not a being bad boy. But mommy. What baby? Mommy put us at me. What happened? And then, and then he didn't want me to have breakfast or anything. Didn't want you to have breakfast? No. Andrew, were you hungry? I'm so okay, Andrew. Huh? Are you a long time on the timeout? A big yes. brown couch? Yes. Mommy, I was going to play basketball. And then, what happened if you want to get out from the okay. couch? Then Mommy? Okay, timeout. Mommy? Again? Again? Mommy? And then we for a long time and time out again, too. How Mommy. long? 100 days. 100 days? Yes, and I can't go to sleep. And I can't eat breakfast. And I, and I can't go to you. You can't, he's saying you can't come to me? Yes. Why? I don't know. Daddy said to me that I can't listen to you and can't talk to you. What and I'm saying, I love you, mommy, and miss you, mommy. Why? I don't know why. I would pick why up. would he say that? I will. I'm going to pick up the orange one. Ow. Guys, guys. Mommy, yes, Anthony, baby. help me. It's okay, you just want to play the ball. Oh, mommy. Guys, you know that's not true, right? Yeah. You always it's can hug mommy, kiss mommy, and tell mommy what? No. That you love mommy and miss mommy, right? Right. Yeah. What's going to happen if you tell me that you love me and miss me and you give me a kiss and a hug? What, what's going to happen? I don't know what's going to happen. Then Daddy's going to pull me outside. Justina tweeted a series of videos on January 8, 2018, captioning the first with, quote, Father and his girlfriend are brainwashing my special needs children and teaching them hatred towards their mommy. Parental alienation equals children abuse. My children have a right to love their mommy. Taking away that right is a crime, end quote. It's clear from these audio clips that the boys are initially extremely resistant to being coached in this way. Um, who do you love? No, nothing. What would you say to me? I just Why? Could you stop while I'm talking? Girls! Mommy, who do you love? No, I can't. Oh, Mommy. Tommy, who do you love? Now, my friend. Mommy, home. Andrew, who do you love? Anthony. Who loves you, Anthony? Anthony. Who loves you? Who loves you? Who loves you, Anthony? Who loves you? Daddy and... Daddy. And Anthony. Who else? Who else? I love Daddy Nigga. Oh. Anthony. Oh. I love Daddy Nigga. Oh. I love Daddy Nigga. Oh. 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 I love mommy. Mommy. I love mommy. 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 I love daddy. No. I want mommy. I love daddy. I want mommy. Mommy is me. 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 Mommy, get up. Yeah. Who do you love? Diane and Dora. <laughs> Who do you want to live with? Diane and Dora. There you go, buddy. I want to live with Daddy. I want to be 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 Daddy. Mommy, you're not nice. Mommy, you're not nice. Mommy, you're not nice. You are 
On January 9th, 2018, Justina posted a video showing then four-year-old Andrew explaining that he was not allowed to run from his father in Angela's car to his mother's, and that if he did, he would be punished by being put upstairs and not given anything to eat or drink. The video caption reads, quote, This video was made after I picked up my children for visitations from their father's house. My son, four years, is terrified and talks about being punished by the father and his girlfriend for coming to mommy. End quote. When mommy came, did you see mommy waiting for you? Yes. So what happened? And you run away from the car. Why? What's gonna happen if you come to mommy? What trouble? Punished? How? How you gonna get punished? What she's gonna do? Put you upstairs? What's gonna happen upstairs? I can't hear you. Nothing. Nothing. And then what's gonna happen? Nothing to eat and drink. Do that, baby. That's why you were afraid to come to mommy. Yeah. Are you going? It's okay, baby. On January 10th, 2018, Justina posted a video with the caption, quote, My children are taught enormous hatred towards me by their father, his girlfriend, and her daughters. Hashtag parental alienation. End quote. From what the boys say in the video, it sounds like Angela's then nine-year-old daughters had even jumped on the anti-Justina bandwagon, telling the boys to push her down because they wanted her to be dead. Those girls were clearly brainwashed as well. Let it never be said that Delana, Milana, and Gia are not victims in this horrible situation, too. Who said, who's saying that? Delana. Delana wants you to push me down. Yeah, and I did it. Again. Yeah. Okay. Well, I didn't stop. And I did it, mommy. What is, why she wants you to push me down? Because, Take a because she wants you to be dead. She wants me to be dead? Yeah. She said that to you? Yes. What did she say? She said, let mommy be dead. She told you? 
that she wants me to be dead? Yeah. Oh, oh no, no, mommy. And I, and I don't want you to do. And I don't want. And I don't want you to be like that. Oh, oh no, mommy. My God. Mommy, I'm, I'm gonna push you down, really. Excuse me, Mom. I'm gonna push you down, Mommy. That is not nice what mommy, she's I telling you. Mommy, I'm gonna push you down. Mommy, 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 I'm gonna push you down. I know. From January 18th of the same year, another video shows Michael dropping the boys off to visit Justina and squeezing one of the boys' hands so hard he squeals. Quote, Cop father forbids the children from coming to their mommy by painfully squeezing their hands and making them cry in order to prove the children do not want to come to their mommy. The father of my kids is a cop who is allowed to abuse his children. End quote. Hi, Anthony! Hi, Anthony! Hi, Anthony! Hi, Anthony! Go, Cookie Cops! Go, 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 baby! Hi, buddy! Hi, Andrew! Let him go! Hi, Andrew! Let them go! They can come to me! Let him go! Let him go! He wants to come here, Andrew! Let him go! What are you doing to them? Every single come here, baby! I got you! I got you! I got you! I got you. No! He's not crying that he's gonna be back in time because you're shooting them! Okay, I got you. Quickly, let's go. Let's go, Pam. <laughs> Reportedly, Justina involved multiple judges, the police, and even tried bringing her son's abuse to the FBI. She warned one judge that if her children remained with their father, they would die. Nothing was done. Records show that between 2015 and 2019, police departments in both Suffolk and Nassau counties received a startling 33 calls to 911 summoning officers to either the formal marital home in Valley Stream or the house in Center Mariches, where Michael and Angela lived with their blended family of six children. Most of these calls were regarding visitation and custody issues. In Suffolk County, Justina claims she was treated by responding officers with hostile attitudes who yelled at her, included false statements in their reports, denied her the ability to file her own written reports, and even threatened her on one occasion. She also claims she was ignored when she tried to make formal complaints in the matter, which she feels was due to Michael's own status as an NYPD officer. Newsday put together a comprehensive timeline of the incidents reported by Justina in which she was intimidated or mistreated, which I will paraphrase for you now. On August 4, 2016, Justina reported to police that Michael had sexually abused two of their sons. Nassau Detective Lieutenant Richard Lebrun, the chief spokesman for the police, said their investigation did not find any evidence to support this allegation. According to a letter Justina wrote to U.S. Attorney William Barr requesting help, she waited for a couple of hours for a copy of the police report at the Nassau County Police's second precinct. When she did receive it, she saw that on the first page, the report stated that she was trying to get custody of the boys. She requested that the statement be removed because she had never said that, but officers refused to remove it. On December 17, 2017, Justina called Suffolk County Police at 9.14 a.m. when Michael refused to hand over the kids for their scheduled visitation. Justina claimed the responding officer included false information in the report, so she wrote her account on a separate page. Justina also wrote, quote, Sergeant David Kopasinski and P.O. Malloy were extremely angry that I wrote my own truthful statements regarding this incident. Sergeant Kopasinski threatened me with calling my job and reporting me to Internal Bureau Affair, even though he is responsible to write truthful and impartial police report. End quote. On December 31, 2017, Justina again called 911, this time at 9.09 a.m., when Michael refused to hand over the kids. She said the officer who responded refused to take a report. When she was able to pick up her children at 10 a.m., she saw three police cars outside Michael and Angela's home and was told that Angela had made a police complaint against her. Later, in a written complaint to Suffolk Police, Justina said, quote, I cannot count on their help because those members of the service are acting in a partial manner, end quote. On January 2nd of 2018, CPS caseworker Michelle Clark made note in a report that she spoke with Sergeant Kopasinski who reported that Justina had alleged ongoing abuse by Michael and Angela. 
even though, according to Sergeant Kopasinski, there was no indication of any kind that there was abuse. He told Miss Clark that the house was immaculate and that all six children appeared healthy and well cared for. When Justina began video recording the situation, he told her that her video could be subpoenaed. On January 15th of 2018, Justina tried to file a report at the 5th Precinct after she came to believe Michael had beaten Thomas. In a later complaint filed with the police, Justina claimed that Officer Lori Ann McManus did not want to hear her story and then tried to change it to support Michael. Justina claimed that the officer refused to take down the information she provided about Thomas having, quote, bruises, coagulated blood, black and blues, and dark red spots on his buttocks, end quote. Justina said that Sergeant William Kraus weighed in at that point, telling her it was legal for a parent to spank a child, even though she explained that this was far more serious than a spanking. She wrote in the complaint, quote, Police officers from the 5th Precinct did not want to conduct the investigation pertaining to my allegation against Michael Valva, end quote. On June 20th, 2018, Deputy Inspector John Cahill, Executive Officer at the 5th Precinct, wrote Justina a letter that exonerated Officer McManus and Sergeant Kraus of her allegations, saying they acted in a way that was, quote, legal, proper, and within department guidelines, end quote. On May 21st, 2019, the NYPD opened its own investigation after Michael filed a complaint against Justina over an alleged incident between them on March 13th in Suffolk County. According to the investigation documents, Justina was never informed what the allegations or the circumstances of the incident actually were, and there is no indication why the NYPD would be investigating an incident out of Suffolk County. The next incident following that one would be the 911 call on January 17th, 2020 leading to Thomas being pronounced dead at the hospital. Suffolk County police officials said in a statement that they were investigating. The written statement read in part, quote, The death of Thomas Valva is unconscionable, and the Suffolk County Police Department sympathizes with Justina Zubko Valva's loss. The department's Internal Affairs Bureau is currently reviewing all interactions and reports regarding this case. Our officers are trained to investigate each case without bias and on its own merit. Due to the ongoing criminal and internal investigations currently being conducted, it would be inappropriate to comment further. End quote. The school Anthony and Thomas attended, East Moriches Elementary School, where Thomas was a second grader, was also aware of the alleged abuse. Reports from the boys' school psychologist and a special education teacher which documented their concerns about Michael and Angela's treatment of Thomas and Anthony, can be viewed on Justina's Twitter account, Stand Against Child Abuse. The report from the school psychologist read, quote, Biggest concern is that Mr. Valva and his fiancée Angela do not understand the depth of Anthony and Thomas's disabilities. Both Anthony and Thomas come into school hungry and frequently say they did not eat breakfast because they did not ask for breakfast or got in trouble. The boys were afraid to go to the nurse's office for a while, and they said it was because they were directed by Mr. Valva and Angela not to go to the nurse's office. This occurred shortly after the school nurse became involved in a CPS case because Thomas had multiple bruises on his bottom from Dad. End quote. The special education teacher's report read, quote, Anthony and Thomas have stated that they were not allowed to eat breakfast because they did not use their manners, say good morning to Angela, or were doing nothing. They have come in crying because of this, end quote. It goes on, including the following bullet points, among others. I'm reading these verbatim. The boys come in hungry and most days state that they have not eaten breakfast. They usually have a half of a Nutella sandwich, two snacks, and a water bottle. I have spoken with Dad that the boys are hungry and need more to eat during the day. I often supply them with cereal bars, chips, fruit, and juice throughout the day. Both boys were coming in with visible dirt on their bodies for days in a row. Anthony has lost 11 pounds in nine months. Thomas has gained one pound in 20 months. Charles Chuck Russo, East Marich's school district superintendent, said in a statement, quote, We continue to extend our deepest sympathies to the family and friends of Thomas Valva. Thomas was a tender, loving boy who made tremendous gains during the short time he was a student in East Moriches. 
While the district legally cannot comment on any specific case, it aggressively reports to the proper authorities child abuse when it is suspected. End quote. And that's where we'll end for today. Join me next week when I will continue my exploration of Thomas's case. Until then, please keep practicing social distancing. The sooner we stop the spread of the coronavirus, the sooner life can get back to normal for all of us. Bye, guys. Please subscribe to Suffer the Little Children on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast listening app. You can also subscribe on YouTube by searching Suffer the Little Children Podcast. Visit the website at SufferTheLittleChildrenPod.com where you can listen to episodes, leave a voicemail, and become a patron for rewards ranging from a shout-out by name on the show to exclusive show merch. Follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, and Tumblr at SufferTheLittleChildrenPod and on Twitter at STLCPod. I've posted a photo album for today's case on Facebook and Instagram. Email tips, comments, questions, or case suggestions to sufferthelittlechildren.pod at gmail.com. You can also read about today's case as well as many others at sufferthelittlechildrenblog.com. This podcast was written and produced by Lane. Music and sound effects for the show were created using sounds from audiojungle.com. Always remember, hug your babies a bit closer tonight. Until next week, bye guys.